Welcome back. Um, this is the ECG case number three from the Paramedicine 101 Facebook site. Paramedicine 101 is also a blog at paramedicine101.com. And I always post these on there after I do it on Facebook because Facebook you get a lot of feedback real fast. So I like posting it on there first. Um, so this is the uh, third one. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm doing a lot of these. Uh, so I'm going to start using a, a welcome screen to look a little bit more official. So there it is. It's got my name on the bottom with my credentials and a nice little star of life on there for you to feel right at home. Um, here's the scenario that I gave. I'm going to move a little bit fast because YouTube only allows so much time. You respond to a community college for a 22-year-old male. He's having chest palpitations. Bystanders call 911 because they said he looked bad. You know, he looked like he was going to pass out. But when you get there, patient's sitting upright. He's alert. He's oriented. He says, I feel fine now. This happens all the time. Let me go, guys. I don't want to go to the hospital. Let me just sign off. We've run these calls before, right? You know, you run there, the patients, maybe they were syncopal, and now they feel fine, uh, but they don't want to go. But you got to do an assessment. You can't just sign them off. you got to do assessment. So you do one. He was having chest palpitations and dizziness, but they subsided before you even got there. He has no allergies. He has no meds. Uh, he doesn't have any medical history. I mean, it's a healthy 22-year-old male. He said that the last thing he ate or drank was Red Bull and a muffin right before class because he's at college. And, and we're thinking, well, Red Bull causes tachycardia. Maybe that's what caused the chest palpitations. That's always a possibility. And he was walking to class. I didn't give the setting. Sorry about that. But I'm from Florida, so I always imagine these people in Florida. Um, and Florida is hot in December. So right now it's October, and it's still you know sweaty weather outside. It's super hot. Um, so I always imagine that our, our patients, if they have tachycardic symptoms, they're somewhat dehydrated. It's one of the first things on my list. On my, of differentials for tachycardia. And we're assuming tachycardia because of the chest palpitations, right? I mean, that's one of the, you know, the hallmark, hallmark symptoms of tachycardia. But currently, his vital signs are this. He's got a heart rate of 75 and regular. Uh, well, that tells us he probably isn't dehydrated because if he hasn't been rehydrated, he should still be tachycardic. So his, he's got normal cardia. His heart rate is normal now. Blood pressure is normal for a 22-year-old male, 118 over 74. And, and whenever you say blood pressure is normal, you got to say it's normal for that patient. This could be severely hypotense for some patients. You know, you got to put them in that setting uh, and, and look at the patient. And don't just consider the number, please. Uh, respiratory rate, 22 and regular. Uh, and, but he seems like he's in no distress. He's got pink, warm, and dry skin now. But the bystanders tell you that he was pale and clammy. That should always stick out with you. That's the shocky patient, pale and clammy. So we say, all right, well, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm going to do an EKG. And here's the EKG I gave you. And I didn't trick anybody. It seems like everybody kind of picked up on this EKG. But just in case there's people out there who didn't want to comment and they weren't really, you know, uh, feeling too confident about it, I'm going to cover the EKG anyhow, just for you guys. Excuse me while I pick my pin color so it can show up. Let's dissect this EKG. It, it certainly doesn't look normal for a 22-year-old male. I mean, it's, it, there's changes on it, so we have to see what those are. Um, it is a sinus rhythm. We see P waves, and they're upright, and they should be upright in all of these leads except for AVR, all the limb leads, except for AVR should be negative, and it is. So that typically means it's sinus, okay? It's probably a sinus rhythm, okay? Um, there's something abnormal here. This is a uh, left axis deviation. It always sticks out to me first because I kind of look at the EKG as I read a book, you know, from left to right. So this kind of sticks out, uh, but it's not super important in most patients. And, and this is what I mean. If you don't understand axis determination, don't don't worry. You can go on ems 12 lecom and look at their axis tutorial, which is really good. And I'm going to do a similar one on video for you here shortly. Uh, but lead one is positive. It's upright. Okay. Lead 2 is negative, and lead 3 is negative. Quick hint, if all of these aren't positive, you have some kind of axis deviation. And if it's like this, if, up, if 1 is up, 2 is down, and 3 is down, you have left axis deviation. And this is actually pathological left axis deviation, which normally we would say the patient's got a left anterior fascicular block. I know that might sound advanced for some of you. It just means it's like half a left bundle branch block, typically. Which in our older patients, not too concerning, um, but this is a 22-year-old male, so that's not normal. That's not normal for a 22-year-old male. We got to look further into the CKG. We look at the ST segments, and most of them look pretty isoelectric. And even with these concave, maybe half a millimeter of ST elevation over this, remember, use your TP segment here 
as your isoelectric line. Maybe there's a little bit of elevation there, but we kind of chalk this up as early repole if there's no symptoms of an MI, okay? Uh, so maybe that's a little bit of early repole. Otherwise, there's another thing on here that kind of looks abnormal to me. V2 is mostly positive. I don't want to get too much into the precordial axis here, but V2 should be mostly negative and you should transition at V3 or V4. Now usually when we say we have early R wave progression, that means that V1 is mostly positive, but it can happen this way too. Uh, V1 is mostly negative, which it should be, but V2 is mostly positive. So it kind of stands out to me. And it kind of makes me think of my list of differentials for this. I think of three things. First thing, right bundle branch block. One of the most common causes of early R wave progression. But with a right bundle branch block, we do kind of have a widened QRS complex here, but we don't have this terminal R wave that we need for a right bundle branch block. Oops, that always happens when I do that click. Um, we don't need that, we don't have that terminal R wave that we would with a uh, right bundle branch block. So, and this is what I mean. With a right bundle branch block, you would have an R wave as the last wave of the QRS complex in V1. Okay, and sometimes you have the bunny ears, that's what people remember is the bunny ears. Uh, but anyhow, you have a big positive R wave V1. We don't have that here. So we gotta cancel out right bundle branch block. Sorry about that. We gotta cancel out right bundle branch block. That, that's not what this is. All right. Uh, posterior wall MI, that also causes early R wave progression. Okay, posterior wall MI will cause early R wave progression, but this is a 22 year old male. He doesn't really have symptoms of an MI. Um, and generally, with posterior wall MI, you'll get ST depression, T wave inversion, and leads V1, V2, at least, sometimes V3. And a lot of times it goes along with inferior wall MI changes. So we don't really have any clinical findings of a posterior wall MI. Okay, so not, that doesn't really fit. I know that's kind of sloppy. WPW, WPW, does that one fit? Well, if you don't know what WPW is, it's an accessory pathway. I'm going to try to write that. Accessory pathway. No, nope, not gonna work for me. There it goes. Accessory pathway. I'm just, that's the best I'm gonna do. Accessory pathway, which means it's an extra lane of conduction. And here's the findings we have. A widened QRS complex. This is a 22 year old male. Look how wide this QRS complex is. Remember, you have very, very fast conduction as a young male. This not so fast. That means slow. Whenever something's widened, it's slowed down. So this is not normal for a 22-year-old male. You also have a shortened PR interval. Look how close that P wave is to the QRS complex. You can see that the P wave ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. Whenever you see that, you know that the PR interval is shortened. So the P wave is ending at the end of the QR, or the, I'm sorry, ending at the beginning of the QRS complex that is an accessory pathway or a junctional rhythm. I mean, there's only so few things that can cause that, so you have to put that in your differential. And then the hallmark finding that everybody sees is the delta waves. Look at these waves right here, these slurring upslope waves at the beginning of the QRS complex, okay? You see how that causes it to look wider? The slurring upslope of the delta waves, uh, the first wave of the QRS complex, that's called a delta wave, and that is WPW in a nutshell. Those three findings are classic WPW. So again, a widened QRS complex, a shortened PR interval, and a delta wave. But why do we get that? Why do we get those things? So let me get my pin back here. I, I know I should just hit that control P. Um, why do we get those things? Well, for one, the P wave is atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is ventricular depolarization. Normally, Okay, I'm gonna bring up my heart here. Watch this, control P, there we go. All right, normally, we get a pause right here at the AV node that gives us this flat PR segment, okay? And that allows for ventricular filling, all right? Ventricle, ventricles fill up because of the atrial depolarization and we have that extra pause from the AV node it allows the ventricles to fill up even more and we get good atrial kick, you know, or ventricular depolarization from filling and I don't know, I'm starting to get off track here. All right, so, but with WPW, you have this accessory pathway. Look over here on the left, accessory pathway. Usually it's called the bundle of Kent, bundle of Kent. Um, 
So what happens when these people have WPW is you get normal conduction this way, the normal orthodromic conduction that way, it hits the AV node and you get your pause. But then you also have conduction right here and there's no pause. There's no AV nodal pause and you go right to the ventricles. So what happens is you start the polarization where essentially you get a fusion beat from these two impulses. Okay, so now you can actually imagine we're going right into the ventricular depolarization and that's where we get our delta wave, our big fat delta wave. I got it down here too for you. Um, and it widens the QRS complex because we're starting ventricular depolarization, you know, quicker. So this one continues to depolarize. This depolarizes a little bit faster. Now we're moving from cell to cell to cell where after the AV node, this depolarization wave is going to move a little bit faster because it has the bundle branch and, you know, Purkinje fibers. It's going to depolarize a little faster and they kind of meet in the middle. And that's what happens with WPW. And it, it can be concerning because you can get different types of conduction. This is considered orthodromic, okay, on the left here, which that's okay, generally. You know, you might get a tachycardia, but that's okay, generally. But this is what you don't want on the right, antidromic conduction, all right, which can become very rapid. If you, if you give an AD, AV nodal blocking agent to this patient, what are you going to do? You're going to slow down this area right here, all right, to the point of where everything's going to want to polarize down the faster lane that bundle of Kent, that accessory pathway, and you're going to get this re-entry tachycardia that looks a lot like VTAC. And who's at risk for those? Kind of gave it away there. Who's at risk for that? AFib with WPW. If, you, if your patient's got AFib with WPW, it looks like this. I know it's hard to see any PR interval or any delta wave, but notice this. The rhythm is fast, broad, and irregular. Fast, broad, that's a B, and irregular. Look like I'm writing like a kindergartner there. FBI, fast, broad, and irregular. Should be easy to remember, right? FBI, like the guys that go out and, you know, law enforcement guys. FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Fast, broad, and irregular. All right? That should make you think WPW. It could be AFib with a bundle branch block, what have you, but you got to be careful with those. If it looks like this, like look at the morphology changes of this. You do not want to give certain drugs. You do not want to give cardizem, okay? Cardizem, which I can't even write it there. Cardizem, because that's the drug that we do commonly give AFib with RVR, or AFib with a rap rapid ventricular response. That can kill this patient. You will get an ugly VFib from that, all right? You'll get super, super rapid conduction down the accessory pathway, and that patient can code on you rather quickly. You do not want to give any AV nodal slowing agent. You don't want to give adenosine, okay? You don't, I can't even write it on here. You don't want to give uh, amiodarone if, if you can avoid it. Now, AHA does kind of say amiodarone's okay, but Dr. Amomatu has done studies on this and seen that there's, uh, uh, you know, instances where amiodarone has caused worse outcomes for these patients. So if you do give it, have your, def you know, defibrillation pads on the patient and be ready to shock, which is the most benign therapy, by the way, or synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion would probably be the best therapy for this patient, okay? If you have it, procainamide would be the best uh, drug to give them, but synchronized cardioversion, probably the safest therapy to give any tachycardic patient, really, um, that's unstable, okay? So here's another example, AFib with WPW. Remember, it's fast, broad, and irregular. Fast, broad, and irregular. You got to think AFib with WPW, and you got to think, I don't want to give AV nodal slowing agents if I can avoid it. I don't want to give the cardizem for sure. I don't want to give the adenosine for sure. And if I can avoid it, I really don't want to give the amiodarone. Um, if I got procainamide, I might do that because that's the safest drug to give them. But, you know, if, if they get unstable, I'll just shock them. I'll just shock them and hopefully, you know, rewire their circuitry, so to speak. All right, so looking at the case that I gave again, you can see that this one's a sinus rhythm. It's not AFib. This is not where you have to be super concerned about the AV nodal slowing agents. But I figured it was a good point to talk about uh, with WPW. And hopefully now you kind of have those hallmark uh, signs to look for in your head. You can identify these patients and you know how to appropriately treat them. I'm Adam Thompson. I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, I'll see you next time.